Are you off to see him then tonight? You got to see Liam. I gave him the first TV, you daft git. <laughs> I gave I had to argue the toss to get Oasis on telly back in 1994, so you Muppets can go and watch them now. Like a pub rock covers band. Hi, ah, you're watching me, Terry Christian, on the Mank, doing venues. This one, the old Nag Z. Tony Wilson never said it. It was a Southern A&R man from a record company. How do I know? Because Tony told me, and Tony has said it, even in mainstream media. An A&R man from London said to me, kids in Manchester have the best record collections. Not him. But you see, this is how myths are made. This is how, this is how people wear crucifixes around the neck. I think it's fascinating. The best night out in Manchester when I was a youngster was a Thursday, Thursday night where you'd literally get into places for next, for next to nothing. So we'd normally come in here, which is the Nags Head, the old Nags Head. We used to go to Tommy Duck's, which had the knickers on the ceiling. Because again, these were all places where you could get an underage drink as long as you behave. I mean, really, underage drinking was a great thing because you didn't go out to get drunk, you went out to look cool because you couldn't drink after 11 o'clock. The main band wouldn't come on till midnight and you'd have been disappointed if they were on air. But you know, they got the pips, you know, behind the cathedral and they'd, you know, they'd have a Roxy room on there. Tuesdays used to have punk night as well. Because we were poor, that punk thing, the idea of it, the anti-establishment, that went on to quite, quite fertile ground. Everyone was ready for that here. And Rafters was a great club. Down in a basement, low ceiling, you know, with literally with rafters in it, you know what I mean, like beams. It was kind of, kind of a vibe, really. Rob Gretton, who managed New Order and Joy Division, when punk was starting, there weren't really any punk records, so he'd DJ and just play all reggae, you know, in between the bands and before the gig and after the gig. Elvis Costello, £1.50. Mm, thought it was a bit of a rip-off. Didn't generate enough excitement for us. You're talking when it was 30 pence a pint in those days. It was just exciting to be out. I mean, sometimes it'd be a lowest common denominator between your mates. I remember a load of us going to uh, the Ritz on their alternative night. <laughs> Two of my mates then, full of weirdos in here and went off. Then I went to school with John Marr, who ended up drumming in the Buzzcocks. To have somebody so close to you, to be in a band and then be on the telly, and then people knew about them. The Buzzcocks were cool. They were one of the three coolest bands, The Clash, The Sex Pistols and Buzzcocks. Manchester always had that kind of moral looseness, you know, non-judgmental. Well, judgmental, but not about those things. It was about being authentic. You know, nobody in Manchester was ever admired just because they had money. It's like, what do you do? What have you done? You know, what difference have you made to my life? Whereas Tony Wilson made a difference to my life. You know, even John Marr playing the drums in a, in a band made a difference to my life. It ho always had that edge, Manchester, and you hear it in the music. 808 State, Clint Boone, Stella Grundy, Marquis Smith, Elkie Brooks, M yeah, MC Tunes, he's an old mate of mine, Black Grape, Kermit at the front. I've been working on the radio in Derby for like six years and, and I'd, I'd won two National Sony Radio Awards. But that wasn't just me, it's because I had a team around me. So I had guys doing the reggae slot for me, guys who were doing the jazz funk, Devin Daly and Chris McKenzie. I learned off them, it was like I went to music university. My blueprint for what I wanted to do on the radio was to play local bands, build up a bit of a scene, just the way Tony Wilson had done in Manchester only like, you know, three years earlier, four years earlier because that to me was something that made everything exciting for us. So when I came to Manchester, I was like a blue-eyed boy for about eight months, that Key 103. So I came sort of October 88, just around the time that Stone Roses, Elephant Stone came out. And I thought, all this stuff's amazing. You had this idea that people thought you were some sort of chancer, you know, because you come from nowhere. Suddenly you're, you're the only show on the station allowed to do interviews or live sessions. So I had the Pixies playing live, you know, James, uh, the Lars, all of that. But I never thought anything of that. I thought, well, this is how you do radio. And I used to get in at 11 o'clock in the morning, at least, to do a show that went on air at six. So Graham Park had worked for me in Derby. Him and Mike Pickering used to come on my Key 103 show every Friday at half eight from half eight till nine to play all the stuff that they were playing for the first time at the Hacienda that night. So I remember them playing, you know, Black Box right on time, you know, for acetate. Where's the Ruthless Rap Assassins? Where's MC Busby? Where's Chapter and the Verse? Where's a guy called Gerald? Where's Harlem Spirit? I've always been into hip hop, yearly hip hop. I, I would always play on my radio shows and that. So obviously with things like grime, rap, hip hop, 
I'm kind of open to that. I remember when all the fast chat style came into reggae with Papa Levi and Peter King and Asher Senator. I love Meeks, you know, respect the come up. Uh, just, just a great track when I heard it. And you know, so and you know, and then there's, there's other stuff, uh, Black Black Josh, uh, Paul Scholes, uh, Children as Use, because I love that. That to me is a Manchester sound. You can feel that vibe, you know, that soul thing. Back in 2020, it was the 30th anniversary of uh, what was an iconic TV show that I did called The Word on Channel 4. And basically, I was poached because Manchester was hit. If you were 14 or 15, the idea of the word was we'll bring you a semi-adult night out into your living room because you're dying to go out at that age. You know, obviously with good bands and all the daft stuff going on and give it that feeling of, of a bit of edginess. In 2020, I thought I'd do a stand-up show based on it. Has got clips of the word and we refer back to it, you know, iconic moments on it. Ollie Reed, you know, uh, Bill Hicks, you know, uh, Whitney Houston. I interviewed James Brown in the Deep South. But it was going to be a 30th anniversary thing and then lockdown happened. I shall be bringing it everywhere soon. So, but, but all, the, all the first shows will be in the Northwest. Terry, can we have a picture? Yeah, yeah, of course, cool, yeah. Looking yeah. well, Terry. It's fine. Hey. 62, three weeks ago. <laughs> I never have to work for a living. <laughs>